I don't have a microphone. Give me a second. Let me let me let me put my microphone on. Okay, is it better now? Is it better? Can you hear me better now? Okay, good. It's happening, guys. It's happening. Well, that was really peaky. It's happening, guys. Woo! That's loud. Hold on one second. God, I just I haven't done this for a while, so I gotta I gotta adjust it. Okay, take three. Take 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 three. Take three. Hey, is it happening? Happening? Hey, okay. Okay. I told you guys I would do this every two to three weeks, and you know how many weeks it's been? It's been four weeks, but it's going to happen right now. I don't know how long this will be. Remember, not much editing, but we are going to go into the seahorse tank. All right, we're going to start with an equipment overview for anybody who's like just joining us. That way you can kind of get a sense of what is actually on this tank. Here we go. This is the JBJ RF 65 and I custom built this. I didn't custom build this tank. I built this tank specifically for seahorses and macro algae. Really, really, I specifically built it for seahorses. All right. That's the reason I built it. And the macro algae were secondary, but it's fantastic. So JBJ RF 65 tank. And all that means it's an all in one system with a rear filtration chamber. And then down below here is just storage. These lights are twin star E series lights. They are a fresh water light, which work perfectly for the seahorse tank since the seahorse tank is pretty much all macroalgae anyways. And I like the natural coloration, especially when you compare it to more of the blues. I think it looks fantastic. Then for the wave maker, I have the, there it is. Can you see it? It is the XF330, the max spec gyre, and I have these NEM guards on here, which are really important because the seahorses like to utilize this area over here, especially in the mornings, to swim around, and they often will not get sucked up, but basically they will get sucked into there, and I think they like it, but without those on, I think the current might be too, too rough, and it might actually hurt them, but these work really well. If you're going to do seahorses, I highly recommend putting these on as well. In the back chamber, I did some of my own plumbing job, but really the only equipment you're going to see back here for the auto top off system, I'm using a reef breeders. What do you call it? Reef breeders prism. That's right, right there. Reef breeders prism. And then I have just a standard cheapo heater, which I really don't need to use very much because this tank is kept quite cool. So I use a chiller. I use the JBJ Arctica. I believe it's a one tenth horsepower. And I keep this tank at 72 degrees for the most part. And right now, since it's winter time, it usually doesn't kick on too much, but the heater almost never has to come on here in the valley. The JBJ RF 65 comes with two return pumps. They're just standard. I don't even know what they are, but they came with the system. And then down here, equipment wise, here's a few things I got. I have the sterilizer. It's a 15 watt aqua UV sterilizer. This is my five gallon bucket for the Reef Breeders Prism LED, which I can't remember. I'm using two of these older Camor X1 dosing pumps. These aren't the pros, just the, the regular X1s. And this Simplicity dosing container for nitrate and phosphate. I am using this Camor Pro dosing phytoplankton down here for my temperature controller using a Bayite, which almost never kicks on because it's just for the heater. And then here is the controller for the max spec gyre. And then I'm using this Wi-Fi strip up here and all the top. There's five Wi-Fi. There's five Wi-Fi outlets and then below are non Wi-Fi outlets. I use a ton of these. And then that is the controller for the, what is it? It's the Varios 4 return pump. And that's because I plumbed in a closed loop system that powers this UV sterilizer, and it also provides water for the chiller. And that is the pump right here. And this is the first time I've ever done a external plumbing, and I love it. You seriously can't hear this at all. It's completely silent. And then the last bit of equipment I think I have is this fan system that I installed. Well, this is when I had, I used to have the, the chiller in here, and that didn't work. And I thought, hey, if I just install these fans, it would help. And it didn't, didn't really help at all. One thing I didn't mention is filtration. The main filtration, honestly, is the macro algaes. They're the main filter. The only filtration I actually use are two filter socks. That's, that's it for filtration. I have up here, I bought this when I bought it, I, this Reef Octopus 
classic HOB because I thought I was gonna need it, but I've never actually needed it because all of the macro algaes seem to be doing a really good job of uptaking nitrates and phosphates especially. Let's talk water parameters for this bad boy. I keep it, see, overall here, my goal is to keep the salinity a little bit, not lower, just 1.025 specific gravity. Temperature, I keep it 72, which means it goes 72 to 73. It's a little cool right now, but that's that's fine. But I want to keep it between like 71 and 74 max. Definitely no more than 74. Oh yeah, just the basic nutrient levels. Let's take a peek here. So we tested it on Wednesday. Seahorse tank, 4.8 nitrates and 0.1 phosphates. So that's pretty much perfect. But if you look up here, the week before, Slightly high nitrates, phosphates were a little bit higher, and the week before that, pretty much the same. What I noticed is the first time I did a big trim, and I trimmed especially this grossolaria here, I mean, it was huge. It was, it was everywhere. Oh, man, this guy's really going at it. He's really, really trying to get all that food in there. <laughs> anyway, okay, what I found is if I trim too much, all right, whatever I have, if I, if, if, if I trim too much, then there's less there to uptake the nutrient levels. So what I need to do now, I've only trimmed it once, but when I trim it again is I'm gonna do a much lighter trim. That way my nitrates and phosphates don't rise quickly. Dosing overview. All right, here are all my dosing tubes, okay? I have a few different things. Right here, these go with that original Camor, and those are for the nitrates and the phosphates, but I don't have to dose nitrates and phosphates anymore. I did before I added the seahorses. But now it's just not necessary because the tank has plenty of nutrients in there since I've added especially other fish and everything else. So I, I, I don't dose anymore. And I just regulate with the macroalgae, the feeding, and then the waste. But the thing I do dose every day, see if you can see really good. Let me get this in the water, see that? That is phytoplankton, actually, and this is a recommendation from Tyler Inland Reef. Inland? I always get it wrong. Is it Inland Reef? I think it's in Inland Reef. And I dose one milliliter of phytoplankton every day, and I use this Easy Booster 25 from Easy Reefs. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. It's, it's a, a gel, so it's super thick. The thing about it, though, is if you dose this, and I love dosing this, by the way. I think it's not only, I mean, the, the reason I do this is primarily for my corals in here, my fans, my gorgonians, because it just produces this really tiny, tiny phytoplankton. But you got to be careful if you're going to do this yourself, because it's a gel, and if you don't put it literally, like you see where it is, it's literally directly on top of the, of the wave maker. If you don't put it directly in front of a wave maker, it'll just fall all the way to the bottom and sit on the bottom. So you need to disperse it. But those are the only thing I dose right now. If I do end up having to dose nitrates and phosphates, I will, but right now I'm just dosing the phytoplankton. Let's talk maintenance schedule. I'll put on a tripod here. Sorry, I just, I think that'll work better. All right, daily, three times feeding. I feed the seahorses three times a day right now. And uh, that seems to be best. They're getting really fat and happy, which I love. I dose the one milliliter of the phytoplankton every day via the Camor X1 Pro. And then I do use, wait a second, I have it right here. I do dose approximately 20 drops of the Brightwell Aquatics Cato Grow, basically like fertilizer from a macro algae. That's every day. Two times a week, I do the filter socks. Yeah, just twice a week, that seems to work really well for me. I feed the corals twice a week, and uh, really I just do a broadcast feed. And I, you know, I really probably only do that once a week. And then I algae scrape the glass. Weekly, I do a 15% water change every week, and I'm gonna keep up on that. I gravel vac the sand bed a tiny bit. It's sugar fine sand, so I don't do a whole bunch. But I try to especially get up some of the biggest seahorse poop. Seahorses poop is big. It's crazy, I didn't know that, and they poop a lot. And I was vacuuming the seahorse poop every day, but I haven't needed to since all the macroalgae seems to be uptaking nitrates and phosphates. And then I do pest removal once or twice a week. I have some flatworms in there and some jellyfish, which I'll show you in a little bit. And lastly, monthly, really it's not monthly, I'd say it's more every other month, is I do a trim. And I pretty much right now only have to trim 
the Grossolaria. Nothing else really needs trimming, but let me show you the livestock and the macroalgae up close here. One sec. Livestock. Let's start with the Gorgonians. I have four Gorgonians in here, and I'll try to get the names right, but I'm not, I'm not sure. This one back here is, I believe it's called a slit pour. It's brownish in color. I don't know if it's doing too well, but it is a favorite hitching post for the seahorses. So that's primarily why it's here. But you don't really see the polyps come out too much, so I'm worried it's just going to basically slowly die. But, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an inexpensive Gorgonian, photosynthetic, so that's fine. Then we have a whole bunch of purple Gorgonians. I believe, I, I don't know the specific name for all of them, but I think this one here is a purple ribbon Gorgonian. And I've had this one the longest, I think. When I first got it, it, I, I didn't realize that I wasn't supposed to expose it to the air. So when I was moving it over here, I totally did. And it grew this kind of hard, hard shell on it, and the polyps never came out. And then because of that, what ended up happening is algae, nuisance algae, just started growing all over it. And I would blast it with a turkey baster, try to get it off there. But eventually what I had to do is I ended up putting my hand on there. And I ended up scraping it off. And I was like, well, it's probably going to die anyways. But it has definitely not died, and it is growing, and it loves the spot. It just loves, like, a direct flow. I mean, I think all Gorgonians probably do, but you can see the flow it's getting. And as it gets taller, it's going to get even more, but it does not seem to mind. And you can see all those polyps coming way out, which is fantastic. So I will try to, by the way, guys. I'm going to try to, after this, do a whole bunch of B-roll to show you guys. Okay, now there's two more purple Gorgonians. I don't know. One of them is, I think, a candelabra, and one is a sea whip. I don't know which is which, but let's look at this one first. I've also had this one for a long time. This one has done well since the beginning. It's much more, here, let me show you this angle. It's better. It has a much more branching shape to it, but uh, seahorses sometimes hold on to this one. Definitely likes the high flow as well, but the flow right where it is right now is not super high. There's a little bit of death. I don't know if you can see that down on the on the right hand side, but other than that, beautiful piece. Not I mean not crazy colors, but I mean look at that. Just the, the the textures. I mean this angle here just makes me happy. I love it. Although I took a picture of this the other day and I put it on Instagram and people uh, and and because there was a there was a seahorse shadow right here and it looked pretty, but everybody just said, "Oh, that looks like a penis." That's pretty much what everybody said. And I was like, "Oh, you're right. I didn't even notice that." Because when I'm looking at it, I'm usually looking at it from this angle, and it does not look like a penis. But, <laughs> but from this angle, I get it. It kind of does. Uh, but anyway, I don't see that very much. All right, so then the other one, which is way back here, is having that same sort of struggle that I talked about. This is a newer one I got. And it's, I mean, it's directly in the flow. You can kind of see it. Like, I mean, this is kind of eye height. So it's, I mean, it's getting the direct flow. And uh, when I take some B-roll, you'll be able to see it. Well, I'll try to get close here. It has that same problem with the uh, growth on it. So it, it seems somewhat unhappy. So it's stayed closed up. And because it stayed closed up, there's some algae growing on it. And I've actually put my hand on there and scraped it off. And I keep using a turkey baster to try to uh, get rid of that stuff. I, I hope it survives. but And I hope it turns out like this one. But I don't know. So I have those four Gorgonians, all photosynthetic. Fish. Let's talk fish. Let's see if we can find them. Obviously, the main fish in here are the four Hippocampus erectus seahorses. They are not a dwarf species. They are a full-size species. They'll get, I don't know how long they'll get, six inches-ish? But sometimes I can't, I can't find them for some, okay, here's one. Here's one in the back right there. They have not been active at all for the first few weeks. I've had them for a couple months now, I think. But they finally started being more active and adorable and going around all different places. And they are especially receptive to feeding time. Love it. But I can only find the, the three right now. So maybe I'll be able to get some more B-roll of them later. But, I mean, this is the whole reason. The whole reason for having them. We've got two males, two females. They are growing. I mean, I can tell their growth. They've already grown a ton and they're eating well, and they look fat, and they look happy, and I'm going to have to find some more B-roll here because I just can't find any more. Okay, then other livestock. Let's see. We have a whole bunch of inverts. We have 
uh, two conches, and it must have been a male and a female, because they keep laying eggs right here. And there, I have seen some baby conches crawling around this tank, which is adorable. But yeah, so, oh, there's the other one, see here. There's the other conch right down there. Let's see if I can make this a little brighter for you. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot. I forgot one of the, I forgot, I forgot one of the, uh, one of the macro. I forgot two. Wait, no, I haven't done macro. Yet. Never mind, never mind, sorry. I only did, I only did Gorgonians. All right, uh, I have um, a whole bunch of Astria snails, maybe Margarita snails, no Trochus snails in here. I probably have 10 to 20 small blue or red legged hermit crabs. I have a six line wrasse and I wasn't gonna put them in here, but then uh, one of my experts said, oh, they actually do really well. So I moved him over, oh, you see him? Wait, he's in the back, is he gonna show? Can you see? I don't know if he's gonna focus, there he is. I'll have to take some video of him. Uh, he doesn't seem to like the camera. He's been very shy. I put him in not too long ago and oh, there he is, floating around. He, I, I've had him, this is the one I've had forever. I've had this guy, seriously, forever. And he was in my quarantine tank. He, he, the, the, the biggest struggle with putting fish in here is when I have to just temperature acclimate them. But seems to be doing really well, really happy. Likes to live right in here. There's like a crevice, and that seems to be what he likes. Oh, there he is, hi. Well, I had to move this clown. This was part of my harem. Now there's only three clownfish in the harem tank. I had to move him over because he was the latest victim to be bullied. But he seems happy in here. <laughs> uh, harem tank failure, of course. And then we have the long fin clownfish, which was also moved over here because of bullying. But these two seem to get along just fine. They've adjusted. If you wonder if you can keep them at 72 degrees, absolutely. They don't seem to have any problem when it's 72 degrees. So, yep. And they have no, I have literally zero issues with them going after or being aggressive. Nothing in here. The six lane wrasse isn't aggressive. The two clowns aren't aggressive. And I don't, I mean, the, the whole point for me is to make sure that the seahorses are happy. Every decision I make in this tank is 100% for the seahorses. This tank is for them. So if there's any problems with any other livestock and they're bothering the seahorses, then that'll be dealt with. But as of now, zero problems. I'm showing you this tank because there's a green clown goby in here I got three days ago and so small, like seriously the tip of my pinky. But he's in quarantine, she's in quarantine for at least three weeks. But that green clown goby is gonna be moved over here once the quarantine's over. And the last livestock I really have in here, which you're not gonna be able to see right now, I have a pistol shrimp and, wait, I think I, think I wrote down, a pistol shrimp and a yellow nose shrimp goby. This, this main rock, this is one kind of big rock, and it's and it's concave on the bottom, so they pretty much have the entire area underneath here. But I'll see if I can find some B-roll of when they come out. They're super cute and super fun to watch. Inverts in the tank. Pistol shrimp is in there. I already talked about the crab. You can see, you can see all the snails on the back, the conches. I was gonna add an emerald crab, but the emerald crab died in transit. And, oh yeah, the other invert I didn't mention. Look at this sponge. I'm having the same problem because my phosphates have been a little high, I think. So I have some algae growing on, oh my gosh. You have to wait. Puppies. Sorry guys, they're very demanding puppies. Yes, go, enjoy. No, but this sponge, this is from Florida. This is a Florida sponge, I think it is. Super pretty, and I just hope that, I, I mean, I keep wiping the algae off of it, but I don't know if that's helping or hurting it or, or what. You can tell when it's doing well because there's these little pores in there that these little feeders come out of, little, little white feeders. And they typically come out, obviously, when, when I'm feeding. You can kind of see, see the little white dots in there? That's kind of what I'm talking about. But I don't know, I'm, I'm hoping if I get my phosphates a little bit lower that this sponge will do okay. I, I mean, it's just just look look at the color. I mean, it's such a unique color for the tank, but I think it's super cool. One other thing I forgot to mention, uh, this is this is just sugar fine sand from Carib Sea. It was dry sand, and I went with it because typically with with larger sand pieces, according to my expert Felicia, the the seahorses will oftentimes feed on here, and I've seen them. They they'll, they'll pick up the mysis shrimp on here 
But if they get a big piece of, of rock or something, uh, it can get stuck and it can cause an infection. So I went with sugar fine, and I haven't had any problems because the flow is not too much with it blowing around. And then this rock is Cornerstone Reef Rock. It's awesome. It's my favorite. It's it's much lighter in weight when you compare it to like a Carib Sea. And I think the colorations look much more natural and they come in unique shapes, evidently including that one shape, which everybody keeps commenting on. But I mean, really cool branching shapes. Like this is, this is like one piece here, which is pretty cool. Okay, macroalgaes. I have five kinds of macroalgae in here. Let's start. Now we're in California, people. So if you're in California, most kinds of Calerpa are illegal. All right, this is Calerpa prolifera and it is legal. All right, I'm only gonna put legal things in my tank. And you can see how this one works. It used to only have like when I first got it, I think it only had a couple branches, but you see what happens here? It sends out these runners. And what I need to do is I need to push this runner down into the sand bed. And then from the runners, it will, it, 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 it will shoot up. So this is doing really well. I love it. I think it's gorgeous. And I'm hoping it'll, it'll kind of keep growing kind of around the edge. I want to keep it off the rock work, but for here, I think it's really good. By far the largest macro algae in here is the Gracilaria, Gracilaria, however you want to call it. See all those white dots on it? Those are all flatworms. Not a big deal. I keep removing them as much as I can. I'm hoping the six line wrasse will start going after it. But I have a ton of Gracilaria. It grows crazy fast. It's really pretty. I mean, when I trimmed it, you could see this entire rock and that was a month ago and look how big it is. It's probably my primary nutrient export compared to everything. No, it, it probably is. It probably consumes most of the nitrates and the phosphates in the tank. And I just need it. I, I just want to keep it trimmed down a little bit because uh, I don't want it to come up too high, but I, I, I kind of want it to kind of wrap around here. Next up, we have the rooted shaving brush, which is having problems. If you can probably see the problems, it's supposed to be green, but it's, you can see like the green shoots, the edges of it, right? But uh, there's so much algae, new, like algae growth on it. And I've tried scraping, I mean, you can even see, look, it's kind of like waving there. I've tried scraping it off. So if you guys know what to do, like, can I, can I just trim it down to the base? And will that help? I mean, obviously I'm trying to get my phosphate levels under control so this doesn't happen. But I, I just, I love the shape of it and I love how it looks and I wish I could get all of that algae off of it so it would kind of return to its, its original color. Next up we have the red grape, I don't know the actual name for this one, sorry. I'm gonna call it red grape algae. It's, okay, some, no, not problems with it, but it comes in these like, in these bunches. And because of the flow, I would really love it to kind of stick up but because of, of, of how the flow works down here, no matter what I seem to do, it just seems to kind of lay there. And I was hoping I could get it kind of to stick up. I might actually put it up and tie tie something around it so that it, it, it has that, but I'm worried it's just gonna keep falling over. I've just attached it with some fishing line to these small rock bases. And the problem I'm having right now, do you see the coloration isn't great? You might, might not be able to see that because I also have algae growing on it. And I'll go in there, I'll rub it off, but then what is, ends up happening is like tons of the little grape things come off. So I don't know if this one's actually gonna survive or not. I like it, I like the textures. Like the, the, the thing about a macro algae tank that I love the most is, is the textures you get and, 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 and the shapes you get. I mean, they're, they're so, they're, everything's so varied in here. I mean, uh, especially, I mean, not only, not only the macro algaes, but especially the, the different Gorgonians and then some of the corals and the, but I just, I just don't feel like I get that in, in a mixed reef tank. It's all much more similar feeling, but this is just so, so diverse. All right, now we have the Codium, which is growing a ton. Codium, I think that's what it's called, Codium. It's this, it's this green one right here. I kind of have it all over. It's kind of hard to attach, but um, I basically tied it to I've tied each piece of this, this codium with fishing line to a small rock and then glued that rock here. But all of these little growths right here, it's growing quite a bit. The thing about codium, I just don't know like where to put it to make it look great. <laughs> you know, the seahorses don't really seem to use it very much. Um, but yeah, I just don't really, I just don't really know where to put it. And the last kind of macro, which isn't actually doing very well, it's this encrusting green 
algae. I don't even know what the name is. It used to be quite a bit more. This seems to be doing a lot better. Like this is actually growth. These, the, these stalks here are growth. And it used to be by itself over here, but the way the currents work, it just kind of has moved it. And you can see, you know, some, some grossularia fallouts down here. Uh, but yeah, you can see kind of look back there. Look, you can see those those greens sticking up. So there is some growth and I kind of, I was kind of hoping it would be like Kind of like fill this whole back corner, but it really hasn't hasn't done that yet And you know, this is a big learning process obviously for me because I don't know anything about I mean I've learned a lot about macro algaes, but Overall, I mean it looks pretty full to me to be honest. I don't really know how much more macro algae I could add you know, and I do have a few other corals in here, which I failed to mention. I believe this one here is a green lobo phytum or a devil's hand leather. I think they call it. I got a small frag from a friend several years ago and there's a big piece here and then it's going to look super blue. Sorry, but this is the same one, right? This is the same lobo phytum right here, but it's just grown and I fragged it and now I have it in here. <laughs> this one hasn't been sticking up. I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that the individual fingers will grow, you know, grow up, 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 so they'll provide good hitching posts. And then I just have this brown leather. I don't, I honestly, maybe it's a lobophytum as well. I don't know what to call it. It's just one of those brown leathers you see. It is growing upright because when I put it in here, the current basically took it and blew it sideways. But I, my wife was like, Matthew, it's, it's going sideways. I'm like, no, 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 just, just wait. It'll find its way and it's finding its way fine. And I've actually seen the seahorses hitch on there quite a few times, but I think those are the only two corals. Oh, and one other macro algae. Do you see that right there? It's bubble algae. I didn't add that in there. It creeped on and normally we are obsessed with removing it, but I'm not going to remove it because this is a macro algae tank and it looks super cool. And yeah, I just think I'm not going to let it grow. So maybe it'll take over that whole rock. We'll have to wait and see. In case you're wondering what food I use, I just follow the recommendations from where I bought these from and I use the, okay, the primary food I use is mysis shrimp and I have found that for the size of my seahorses, the best mysis shrimp, sorry guys, oh really, you need to come in, come on, I'm not playing right now, the best mysis shrimp has been the Hikari mysis shrimp. Uh, the, the size seems to be good. I've also used some mini mysis, which just seems too small. And I've used the PE mysis or Canadian mysis or um, what do you, what's the lake called? Okanagan mysis, same thing. And they like that as well. I just ran out. It's much bigger, but they seem to be able to eat that. But I just feed, oh, what are you doing down there? See, they're getting so much more curious now and exploring. I don't know what he's finding down there. Anyway, so that's what I feed three times a day, pretty much mysis shrimp. I do put some coral food in here once a week, probably, um, just kind of blast everywhere. And then the phytoplankton, I think, does a good job every single day. And I think that's part of the reason that some of these, I can't remember the name. What are they called? Wait, wait for it, everybody. Wait for it. I know it's going to come to me. It's going to come to me. It's coming. Wait for it. It's, I, f I feel like it's coming. Gorgonians. I think the Gorgonians are really happy about that. Okay, well... This video sucks. You know, I'm so used to making good videos and I can't stand, <laughs> I can't stand just doing what I'm doing, but, but I, I promised, I promised, I promised I would do it. So I have to do it. I will try to take some B-roll so that when I'm talking, I can just show you some, some pretty shots. Cause that was, that was so terrible. Ugh, it hurts me to make it. It hurts, it hurts. Okay. We have a few things I want to talk about. I want to talk about problems thus far. And I'm using my notepad here. I have this fancy little notepad that I love, so I gotta find it first. Problems. Um, I've had this, I can't remember, I've had it up for six months now, started, and there have definitely been some problems. Problems thus far. The first big problem I had was jellyfish. Oh my god, my dogs! Stop it! Goodness! Seriously, I, how many times a day can I let them in and out? It's exhausting! Oh, okay. All right, problems. First up, jellyfish. And I, I'm going to stop looking at myself here. I'm going I'm to hide this so that I can't look at myself. Jelly, oh, wait, wait, am I recording? Yeah, okay. I have these really small jellyfish in here, and they might be called like hydroid jellyfish, something like that. And there's, they're still around, but they're not very much. And I, from what, from what little I knew is, is they weren't good for 
for seahorses. They could sting the seahorses. Well, I did a little more research and I found out those little jellyfish that I have slash had actually won't sting the hippocampus erectus, like the normal sized. They are not necessarily great for uh, any sort of pygmy or mini species. So I waited months to get rid of them because I was told they would just disappear on their own and they never did. I would siphon them out and everything. And then once I figured out it didn't matter, then I bought. I bought the seahorses like the next day. Uh, diatoms, I had a lot of diatom growth and you can see on the macro algaes, I still have a lot of, I don't know if they're diatoms, what kind of algae they are, but I haven't quite been able to get those water parameters just right yet. So I've been dealing with some of that, I mean, it's nuisance algae. It's not like a terrible nuisance algae. Um, so yeah, I'm still struggling with that, but the sand bed is clean. For a long time, the sand bed was awful, but I've finally gotten the sand bed looking white and pristine. So overall, I'm pretty happy about that. Cyanobacteria, I had it. It's gone. I didn't, I didn't treat the tank with anything. I just, I just, I think I just blasted it and I sucked it out. So yeah, that was easy. Um, getting macro algae to stay put. This has been the hardest thing. Like not knowing anything about macro algae and having Tyler help me at Inland Reef. You know, he taught me all the tips and tricks. And so, you know, you can just stuff it into crevices of the rock. But the problem with a lot of human made rock is it's not super porous. So there aren't a lot of places for that. So I had like the codium and the grass celery and I would stuff it into cracks and two or three days later, it would just, it would just blow free. So I eventually had to um, get small frags, tie the macro algae to the frag and then glue the frag onto the rock work. And that seems to have worked actually really well and that's not true for all of the macro algae of course uh like the shaving brush one here is just rooted so i just piled up some sand around the base the grape i did have to tie because it doesn't root the calerpa i just pushed in because it, it sends out the shoot and it does root but that's been a little bit of a struggle figuring out exactly how to do that and i i one of my least favorite things is, is getting my hands wet and splashing water all over my body, not for my body, but then it just gets on the floor and it gets on the tank and I hate doing that. But I've had to just say, you know what, Matthew, screw it. You just have to do it. So I have, and I've learned, learned a lot about that. Lights too small. These lights, these are European. Well, I, I mean, they're, they're Korean, right? But I think they appeal to the European market and they use centimeters. So when I bought the tank, it was like, I can't remember. I, I, I'm not, not going to say, I think it was like 900, 900 millimeters. I, I don't remember. Right. But the lights from the calculations I did were the right size, were the right size. But when I got the lights, they were like three quarters of an inch too small, meaning that they would have just fallen in. And so I literally had to put glass on the top for quite a while and then just rest these on the glass. But what I did is I ended up, let me show you here. Let me, let me, let me show you Hold up here. Hold up. Hold up. Okay. The microphone's not going to be good. Sorry. But you see what I did here? Look. I got these stainless steel, oh, I don't know, they're meant for seawater, these stainless steel thingies here, um, I, what are they called, whatever, and I had to find these number one screws, these are the world's tiny screws, and they don't exist at any hardware store, so I had to buy them online, and the number one screws only come in, no, there are number one, I had to get number two, and luckily it, it worked, but uh, I had to get it like three quarters inch, I put some spacers in here, I did it on both sides, and look. Look how, I mean, look at that. It basically gave me just enough so it doesn't fall in. So that problem has been solved. Okay, next up, next up, um, bubble algae. I'll show you the bubble algae. At first I was like, oh no, bubble algae in a tank. I should get rid of it. And I'm like, Matthew, this is a macro algae tank. It looks good. So it's actually not a problem. Flatworms. I don't know what they wrote in on. And I've actually, I've never had flatworms before, which is crazy. They seem to be a really, really small flatworm. And I don't know what sort of problems they'll cause. They certainly like, like the Gracilaria and they're all over it. And I, when I added the six line wrasse, I was hoping the six line wrasse would, would eat them. I haven't seen that yet. So I do try to remove them, but I, I, I don't know. It's, maybe you guys know this. Is there a problem with small flatworms in a macroalgae seahorse tank? Will they bother the seahorses or the macroalgae? For now, it doesn't seem to be a problem, so I'm not really worried about it. Algae growth on macro algae, talk about that low. Oh, so before I added the seahorses, right, I had really low nitrates and phosphates, obviously, because the macro algae was consuming it, so it was dosing nitrate and phosphate. I added the seahorses, and I knew that was going to change, and 
it did, and they went up a little bit, but not not a lot. My nitrates and phosphate, my nitrates are probably, you know, around five. My phosphates were below 15, below 0.15. So that was fine. But the big problem happened when I did a, my first big trim of the Grossularia. Um, I must have taken out at least half of the Grossularia before the seahorses came. And, and I think what happened is you know, the, the larger the macroalgae gets, the more it consumes. So when I took out half of that, it was consuming way less. So I struggled with high nitrates and high phosphates for a little while, um, but but not terribly so. Like it never got really far out of hand. Like I think the nitrates got up to like eight, which isn't, I mean, I don't care about that at all, but the phosphates were definitely creeping up in, into the 20s. I think that one time they got to 0 0.3, and that's when I think I started getting all of that algae growth on the macroalgae. So I'm trying to bring those back down and it's been working. And I think the biggest thing is just to not, not cut the grossularia so much. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Problems thus far. That's, those are the problems. Things I've learned. A couple things I've learned. Alyssa's seahorse savvy is amazing. That's what I've learned. I, I've worked with a few people to make this happen. Uh, this originally started with Marine Depot, yeah. This originally started with Marine Depot, and Marine Depot and JBJ. JBJ and Marine Depot supplied the tank, the tank and the stand. That was supplied. The idea started with them. Uh, and then I had Felicia, Felicia McCauley, as my expert. She worked for Marine Depot at the time. She's on the East Coast. She's written tons for coral magazines, has raised seahorses on her own. And she was my go-to. So we would... Sorry, the cats are going crazy. We would talk on the phone. She was super generous. I said, what do I need to buy? And she said, buy this, this, and this, and this. And I did. And so anytime I have a question, she's the one I go for. <clears throat> and she's been super helpful. And when I said, where do I get my seahorses from? She says, Alyssa Seahorse Savvy, period. And that's what I did. Then Tyler in Lynn Reef has been helpful. He has been my macroalgae expert. So he's the one that told me to get this light. And he's the one that sent me my first macroalgaes. And he has been a huge help with the macroalgaes. And then when I finally ended up ordering from Alyssa Seahorse Savvy, I didn't even know the site existed. But everything on their site is built around seahorses, which is super cool. So if you want to do a seahorse tank, but you're like, I don't know what's seahorse safe or what's not seahorse safe, you just go to Alyssa Seahorse Savvy. I, I don't know if it's seahorsesavvy.com, but just type in Alyssa Seahorse Savvy. I'll put a link below if I remember. But everything on that site is safe for seahorses. So you can, you can look at her corals. You know, because some corals will sting seahorses. But all the corals she sells are safe for seahorses. You can look at the inverts. You can look at the, I mean, she has a huge macroalgae selection, a huge macroalgae selection, which I kind of don't want to tell you guys about because I kind of want to keep it for myself. But, I, but well, I mean, you should check it. She has so many macroalgaes in there. And then she has all these beautiful seahorses that she raises. And then she has so many fish. And they're all, they've all been acclimated to her tanks. So she does some sort of quarantine process there. So anytime I'm like, what do I need for this tank? I just go to Alyssa Seahorse Savvy now and I just browse because I know that everything I'm looking at, I don't need to do research for and I can just buy anything on that site and it will work out well. And she's super nice to talk to. I've talked to her once on the phone and emailed. So yeah, Alyssa Seahorse Savvy. Uh, by the way, um, I paid for everything in the tank, right? Seahorses, macroalgaes, corals, I paid full price for all of them. So none of this, so when I'm saying Tyler or Alicia or Alyssa Seahorse Savvy, I'm not like secretly plugging them. I bought from them full price and I'm just super happy. So I wanna give them a little shout out in case you wanna do the same. What else? Um, jellyfish, I did learn those jellyfish are not necessarily, those small ones are not dangerous to the erectus. I didn't know that. That I mean, I would've waited forever. Uh, luckily I figured that out. Next thing, seahorses have not been super active. I thought they would be more active, and I didn't realize how long it would take for them to acclimate into the tank. Now, I don't expect them to swim around like Chromus or Anthias, um, but they were, man, those first month, especially the first couple weeks, very timid, you know, and I was feeding them four times a day then, just like, oh my God, please eat, please eat, please eat, and I would watch them, and they, they would eat, but now, I mean, after a couple months now, they're way more active. And I'm not saying they're chromis active, but they'll swim around the tank. They will actively go after the food. I will watch them in the mornings, especially do the little mating dances and they'll kind of go up and down and up and down. Um, I wish they would spend more time in the front because I kind of built this section for them. 
So that I was like, oh, I want to see them because they like the open area, but they love that slit pour Gorgonian in the back. And so half the time, they're either at the slit pour Gorgonian or they're hanging on to the very, very base of the shaving brush. And then I still can't see them very well. But all right, what's next? What's next? Those are the problems I face. What's next? Livestock, the clown goby is going to be moved over. I'd like to add a brittle star, maybe an emerald crab in here, and then other some other small fish. I don't know. Um, I'll get them from Melissa, Seahorse Savvy, but the clown goby is so small, but I do want to get a few more small fish for the tank. It's definitely more full now with the fish I've recently added, so probably not a whole bunch more. Just kind of enjoy it, let it grow out, deal with problems as they arrive. Grow out, I don't really think I have much space here for any more macros. I'm, I'm, maybe I do, maybe I don't. I'm still learning a ton about everything in this tank. So I'm just going to let it grow out, trim, make mistakes, see what happens. And lastly, I am just trying to let this tank stabilize. This tank for me is not a, a teaching tank. You know, what I, what I do for, for bulk reef supply and what I used to do when I made more videos at my first fish tank were, were all teaching videos. Um, but this tank was really just for me. It was something I wanted to do. And it's my favorite tank. I like it more than, I like it way more than the harem tank, which was a failed harem tank. Uh, at least the anemones are alive. And then I do like it more than my reef tank, which I do like. But this tank is gorgeous. I like the more natural colors of it. Uh, I like the inexpensive nature of, of the macro algaes. I like the textures of the tank. So I don't know, there's, I mean, if you guys are interested in the saltwater hobby and you have a reef tank, maybe try one of these. It, they're a lot cheaper and I just think they're more, they're more interesting, to be totally honest. But yeah, this tank has just been for me and my goal is to just keep this tank here, hopefully have long-term success with it and keep it until the seahorses die. And that could be, what, over five years if I do a good job? So yeah, hopefully I'll, I'll give you guys updates, but hopefully there won't be a whole bunch to update and it'll just, just kind of go well. Maybe I'll experiment with some different macro algaes, you know, as things grow out. I, I, I'm i not really sure, but I don't really have a, a grand plan for it. But that's it guys. I It's really hard for me to make these videos. I didn't realize how hard it would be, honestly, for me to make these unedited rambling videos because they just go against the grain for what I like to do. But uh, things are going well. Work-wise, still making a couple videos a week, except during those Black Friday sales of Bulk Reef Supply. I don't know if you guys watched any of those videos, but I've made five videos a week <laughs> for two weeks. So I was cranking those videos out. So that's why there was a gap at Bulk, at, at bulk Reef Supply. But things are still going really well there. I love working for them and I love working from home. Other than that, I hope to make a video in two to three weeks, not four weeks. And I think I owe you guys an update on the Clownfish Harem Tank. And I think I'll probably do the harem tank and the lagoon tank over there. But really, these are the two cool tanks. The other ones aren't as cool anymore. But you probably would like to learn a little bit about it. And let, like to, well, whatever. I'll give you an update in a few weeks. I think that's it, everybody. Yeah, Sunday. Today's an F1 race. So I got to edit this video so that I can watch the F1 race later. I'll talk to you guys later. Mm -hmm.